welcome to the Bridgeton Library. Today we're have, very happy to have our friend Marcelo Gracia here. He is the New Jersey Watershed Ambassador, one of 20, I believe, and it's for this region. What number is your region? So this is region number 17, includes the Cohansee Morris and Salem River watersheds. Oh, that's wonderful. And hey, you know about the Cohansee River because we're in Bridgeton and the Cohansee is about a block and a half away. So, um, Marcella, what's the program all about? What is, what is a, being a New Jersey Watershed Ambassador? So we're under the AmeriCorps program, and basically the AmeriCorps just, uh, they serve the uh, nationwide. Uh, and our specific program is um, specified to watersheds to help improve the health of watersheds and spread uh, environmental education and in the areas that we're serving. So we do presentations for schools, for libraries like this, um, do tabling at, at fairs normally. Uh, and then we also go into the waters and streams to perform water ass or yeah, assessments of, of the streams. Uh, we collect macroinvertebrates, which are insects, worms, stuff like that, uh, just to see if the water's in good health or not. And then we also partner up with local businesses and organizations uh, to, to do projects such as cleanups, tree plantings. Uh, we had a dune grass planting uh, event previously. I just recently had a cleanup at a, a pond uh, in, in Oldman's Township, and we, we collected like 17 tires, uh, wow. 23 bags of trash. So that's some of the stuff we do, just presentations, assessments, and projects like that. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you ever hook up with local dot .orgs, like, like Citizens United to Protect the Maurice River, or mm -hmm. some of the other water keepers in the area? Uh, we, we can. I think um, the Morris EU partnered with CCIA recently, which I'm hosted at. Uh, for the trash hunt this last last weekend uh, right. and different groups went into different areas to collect as much trash as they could and that did that go well did they was mm -hmm. their hunt successful <laughs> <laughs> yes it's not hard around here Cumberland County has an abundance of beauty and trash so we need to make sure that we keep that stuff off the roads and out of the streams and properly dispose of it oh. <laughs> so tell me about um uh, why is what what is what what got you involved with being? Why did you want to become an ambassador? Yeah, so I studied uh, environmental science in, in college, um, and I was looking for opportunities. And I saw the program like a couple of months before I graduated. It, it hadn't opened up yet, but I, I found it really interesting. Uh, and the summer before that, I also worked with an AmeriCorps, um, somebody who was in AmeriCorps in the Houston Parks and uh, Recreations Department. They did like a lot of environmental stuff with them. And I found that interesting, like what she was doing and uh, reading up on the program description and stuff like that. It really interests me. So once it opened up, I applied. What are you planning on doing with your education and all of this experience? Yeah, so I'm hoping to, you know, uh, get some connections and uh, experience in the field, especially since uh, you need a little bit of experience to, to get uh, that full time job. And hopefully I'll transition into that into maybe environmental consulting or uh, government work. That's great. I don't know if you're going to do that in Texas or here, but there's a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. here in New Jersey to do that. So let me know, because a lot of people I graduated with at Stockton mm -hmm. around like 94, 95 are all now CEOs of different dot orgs mm -hmm. across the state. And they've you know been working at it for over 20 years. That's and awesome. I'm very proud of my <laughs> my class of whatever at Stockton. But I my environmental science was my minor. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really it's just a passion of mine, to, yeah. you know, about nature and keeping things right with That's the planet. Awesome. So tell us, what is a watershed? So a watershed in, in the most basic description is the area of land um, that all drains into one point. So the watershed we're at, number 17 in Jersey, it all drains to the lower Delaware. Um, in different parts of Jersey, all drain to different parts of either the Delaware or um, the into the Atlantic. Ocean. Yeah. And yeah, and eventually all water drains or into the, the ocean. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it, it, we all live in a watershed since it covers the land as well. So anything you drop on the ground, any uh, litter, trash that you leave on the ground, it'll end up in the water as well. Fuels, mm -hmm. oils, pesticides, Fertilizer. all that runoff yeah. will mm -hmm. eventually end up in, in our waterways. So um, what, is this, what is this Enviroscape all about? Why is this a good teaching tool? Yeah, so this Enviroscape is going to be um, a presentation tool that we use to demonstrate what the watershed is, since all the water, no matter if you start up in this mountain or down in uh, the low farms, it all end up down in this, uh, what is representing the lower Delaware. Right. Um, so it doesn't, it, you, you can see where you live um, or even further away uh, where people work. It all, everything will always end up in the same place at the end. Mm. 
you can, if you want to, you can put some more cars and, and stuff like that on to sort of represent human mm -hmm. activity. Yeah, so uh, this is representing like a construction site. We have uh, some construction um, equipment, I guess, uh, and they're building just another house in this neighborhood residential area. Right. And I guess we have people speeding down the, the highway. With those high-tech <laughs> racing cars. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, you just have uh, cars around, um, driving around. Uh, uh, parked in, in big uh, parking lots of this factory right. uh, for work. Um, and maybe leaking stuff that they shouldn't yeah, be especially out of their engines. Old, yeah, older cars uh, will do that. So you always want to keep uh, maintenance on these cars. Uh, just as, uh, you know, if you're owning a car, you should have regular maintenance to prevent all this stuff from leaking and stuff like that. And then we also have a, a farm over here. We have here growing crops and here we have like a... The, the animals at the farm, uh, which need food, uh, the farm seed fertilizer, stuff like that. Here's some cool geese. <laughs> we'll stick them next to the chickens. <laughs> yeah, it's frolic. You don't mind if I... Uh, no, of course, go ahead. Play with the critters, right? Yeah, keep the bull inside the pen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so... And, a, you know, you need a yellow dog wherever you're going to go. He's just <laughs> sort of making sure everybody stays okay. Right, yeah, and... <laughs> Even in like the homes that we have over here, we'll also find like, well, let's just say this is a dog, <laughs> it's a horse. Uh, <laughs> but you have your pets at your, at your own residential area. So there's different animals in different areas as well. Right. And they make an impact. Right, also. yes. So any waste that, you know, it, it's Methane especially in the waste, farms, right? yeah, where it just washes off into the water. Look at this little piggy mama. We'll put piggy mama <laughs> down there. All right. So tell us about what's going on here. Um, Why do you have a spray bottle? Yeah, so basically during the presentation, I'll do, um, I'll, I'll be showing different parts of where non-point source pollutions comes from. Uh, and this is like a wastewater facility and it's a, 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 a factory, I guess. Uh, and they produce point source pollution, but I'll also be showing more importantly, the non-point source pollution, how it comes from all these different areas. Uh, and how when it rains, it's representing a, a little cloud over here. Uh, when it rains, everything, you know, is going to be washed off into the, into the river. And it doesn't matter really how little is, is happening over here. If there's a lot of little things happening, it'll add up at the end. Yeah, it does. So go for it if you want to do your presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, let's start uh, here in this uh, residential area. Or let's actually start with the different types of non-point source pollutions. Um, we can start with, with fertilizer, um, which is what um, we use to grow plants to, to make them uh, thrive um, and grow, especially in uh, poorer areas of soil. So we definitely know that um, there's fertilizer use in this, these farms. And a lot of pesticides. Yeah, right? and a lot of pesticides as well. Unfortunately. Um, and um, you also use pesticides in your homes to keep your gardens green to um, yeah, to keep flowers in season. Uh, and this is supposed to represent a golf course here. This is a little club or country house. Uh, and they use a lot of uh, fertilizer as well just to keep their lawns green, um, to keep the golf course running year round. Right. Um, and maybe even in the factory, they have their little gardens on the side, uh, the park lawn, stuff like that. So they might use a little bit of fertilizer as well. Uh, and then the like you- Pesticides. Yeah, and like Definitely. you mentioned, a lot of pesticide is used, and we could use um, we use these little plastic balls to represent pesticide. Uh, okay. And like I said, the fact the around the factory they might use it to for plants around the to to adorn the place. Um, right. They'll use it to keep off bugs to keep to keep the in, the plants growing. Around your home, you might use some pesticide to again keep out bugs to. Uh, from eating the plants that you're growing, um, you may use, even use some pesticide on your on your dogs and your pets to keep fleas and ticks away. Um, right. So we'll put a little bit there, uh, and a lot of it is, of course, used in like you mentioned in the agriculture areas uh, to keep those crops growing um, and to keep them from getting eaten or, or infected by by diseases and pests. Yeah, there's um, a lot of stuff on the farms, unfortunately. Yeah, and some of the animals as well, you're gonna be using them to keep them clean of pests, right. uh, stuff like that. That's why I always tell everybody how important it is to buy organic produce and support your organic farmers. Mm. Just to, you know, 
because I know that they're not using a lot of toxic stuff that's going to eventually end up into the right, water. Right, yeah. They can, if it's organic, you can't be using man-made chemicals. Um, yeah. But yeah, so now I'm going to try to show a little bit of the soil um, that, that can be eroded. Uh, and end up, it also ends up in our waterway. So in this construction site, especially where soil is being moved around all the time, you're going to get a lot of soil pollution around here. Um, that's going to eventually rot away. So a lot of soil being moved, that means it's not stable. Any little wind can pick it up. Uh, this uh, preserve that we have, nature preserve that we have here, um, if there's any logging that occurs, or even just because it's uphill in a mountain terrain, if there's not enough trees, tree roots to protect the soil in place, a lot of it's gonna also be eroded here and run off, especially if there's like logging or deforestation. And Chris would say this tree is taken away. Now, even this area that used to be covered, it's also gonna be a lot of soil pollution. Mm. Yeah, a lot of runoff silt and dirt that exactly. ends up in the, in the water. Um, so now I'm gonna... And that affects the fish, the fish Exactly, the yeah. Critters. They suffocate. There's yeah. not enough sunlight for seep or for the, the plants in the, in the streams. Right. Um, but yeah, so now and I'm gonna... The, or with the agricultural runoff, there's a lot of nitrogen and other right, yeah. stuff that, that kind of That's makes the, the water dead almost. The fertilizer, yes. Yeah. yeah, so it's like a... Deprives them of A oxygen. bloom yeah. of, of life from those fertilizers in the water. But there's so much that they take up all the oxygen and die off. And create this dead zone where nothing can really grow anymore. Right. Um, so now, uh, pets, animals, they produce waste. Uh, animal waste, uh, if you don't pick it up especially, you can have some of this on your lawn. So when you walk in your, at your pets, uh, this one's not really showing too well, but I'll use this one. Uh, and you get a sure lot you of don't want to use a brown one for pet waste? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, and you'll have a lot of that in your farms, especially there's such oh, a large yeah. concentration of, of cattle, of, of any animals, Pigs. really. Yeah, yeah. everybody. And, and it's hard to uh, pick up. In your own neighborhood, it's easier when you're walking your pet. They, they have some ways you can pick it up easily uh, and stop that non-point source pollution from occurring in the first place. Um, and then you have your cars. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, they, they leak if they're not properly maintained. Uh, especially in these large parking lots where the pavement doesn't let anything soak through really. It just runs off immediately. Uh, and I can represent this oil, this any anything that leaks uh, okay. from the vehicles. And on the road, <laughs> uh, you'll have any, you know, residual um, oils that's leaked out. Parking where the car's parked especially as well. Right. Uh, and this can all, again, be... Um, a way to stop this is by just keeping maintenance on your vehicles um, to make sure that they're not leaking anything. I can imagine those big giant box store parking lots too, mm -hmm. or malls. Right. As a, as a Especially, place for yeah, because there's not, uh, there's so many different tech cars there, so many different people. Some maintain their cars, some don't. Yeah. So that's going to be a big source of uh, non point source pollution. Right. Um, and I didn't really talk about this with the wastewater factory. This is where our waste uh, will go to get recycled or to. Uh, clean out water, but I'll still have some waste from there. Uh, they'll go into the, the stream right here. And uh, let me see. Yeah, so that's, that's for some non-point source pollution. And non-point source pollution basically means just pollution that comes from many different little places. You can't really point to one specific thing that's causing it. And there's so many little ones, they add up uh, at the end to, to create a good amount of pollution. It could be even something like a lawnmower or mm -hmm. a blower or yeah. any gas-powered things or even a barbecue. Yeah, yeah. If you leave that kind of stuff. coal or yeah. charcoal into the into the yard and you just wash it off with a hose or something. Yeah. But that's also getting adding up to the other stuff that's getting washed off by the rain, by other hoses. So, like, so now I'm going to try to... Uh, use my rain cloud here to create this little little rain um, and everything's gonna start washing away. Um, so yeah, let's start raining here. No, not that. <laughs> and you can see that the the rain is mixing in with the pollution in the ground. Right, it's starting uh, to run yeah, down. And it rains down pretty, pretty clean water originally, but once it starts mixing in, you don't really wanna drink water that's already been on the ground for a little bit. So you can see it's starting to mix. And it's starting to run off into downhill. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the water goes really after a while. It just goes downhill. 
like it's raining today so yeah you know. exactly so really the water it, it's good it cleans away a lot of the stuff that's on the ground but it takes it all with it too in our model to the lower dell you can see the water starting to come through it's very dirty yeah. it's not um it's not clean like when it rains yeah it's not it's not the same as the water in a cloud at all oh, knocked over the, the doggy <laughs> um, the dog horse <laughs> so yeah i'm just trying to get a lot of this water in especially in springtime when it's raining a lot mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff and I, I didn't really show it in the example, but there's a lot of uh, salt that's applied to roads in the winter to keep our, our roads safe for yeah. driving. Um, yeah. And that'll also be in, in the, go into the water at the end. There's a lot of, our program also does a lot of salt monitoring um, in the winter when we, it's too cold to go outside. Or to go into the water, we just monitor the water for the salt levels. Um, amazing how it all comes down yeah so even if it, it takes maybe sometimes a couple of months a couple of weeks for uh something that you originally dropped in the water to come down to the to the lower delaware it'll always end up there uh, and each watershed the water ends up in different spots so right here the salem uh Cohansi and morris river watersheds it all ends up in the lower delaware right yeah i've been kayaking and canoeing and on boats on two out of three of those rivers and they're very beautiful. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that they stay nice they stay and beautiful. healthy. Mm -hmm. So what else do we got here? Is it, you yeah, see so, it all draining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of these, <laughs> what was pesticides, they didn't really drain, but uh, they, they would drain as well. Uh, they just didn't go wrong with the water. <laughs> I'm just going to put this little sure. up here just so it catches that. Okay. But yeah, I mean, if there's any questions about it. I'm, I think that you explained it pretty well mm -hmm. as you went along as to what's happening. And I think that um, it's really important that people are aware of every little thing that they do contributes to a right. bigger whole. And when, all you, when you get all that stuff together at once... It can really create a problem for uh, your waterways. Yeah, so you know, now I'll talk a little bit about like the, the things that we can do to help improve the the water or just stuff that we can do. So like I was mentioning before, maintenance on cars, um, just to keep them um, not leaking and or anything like that. Uh, picking up after your pets your pet's waste when you're taking them for a walk, preventing that waste from entering the water. There's already a lot of waste that comes from farms. Uh, when you're applying fertilizer or pesticide to your, to your gardens, um, always read the directions. Don't use too much. Uh, a lot of the reason that this r runs off is because uh, there's too much use that the plants don't absorb. So as soon as it rains, it will just get washed off. And you also want to avoid using these products, you know, a day or two before it rains because it doesn't give it enough time to, to actually even work. So you're just wasting the fertilizer pesticides and it, it runs off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And may I even suggest uh, that people don't even use it at all and find mm -hmm. alternatives like, yeah. ha ha like, like ladybugs, put some ladybugs in your garden. Mm -hmm. That'll help eat some of the pests right. that you don't want to keep your fruits and veggies and flowers going. And also plant a rain garden instead of having a giant expanse of lawn because lawns are kind of unnatural and mm -hmm. they don't really occur in nature. You know, mm -hmm. people like them. Yeah, it's and, nice. You know, the roots aren't as deep. They the, they're, they're tiny and they, mm -hmm. don't, they don't contribute to the groundwater. All the water gets kind of blown away or washed away Run off, yeah. or, you know, from the wind. And if you have a rain garden with roots that go down into the ground, it's making that water like replenish the groundwater. So there's a lot of things that we can do personally with our own little piece of land that is our yard. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, how do you tell a, a corporation, don't right. please stop using pesticides around your parking lot, you know, yes. without them being like, mind your own business lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a lot of it, you know. Or not, how do you tell a farmer not or to go to organic if, yeah. if their, you know, if their plants are getting eaten and their, their profits are going down, they have to feed their families too. Exactly. But there's ways that we can all work together to make it better. Yeah, so like I mentioned at the beginning, non-point source pollutions, they come from a lot of different areas. Uh, and even if it's just a little thing, it, it's a little thing over here, a little thing over there, it all adds up. But just like that, we can also do a little uh, bit here, a little bit there to help improve the water. Exactly. 
And um, thank you so much for showing us this, Marcel. Is there anything else that we should ask that we haven't that you want to let us know about non-point source pollution or our watersheds? Um, I think I, I covered everything, but you know, if you guys want to um, know, learn more about the program um, that I'm in, you can always go to the New York City Watershed Ambassador Program. We have a Facebook page and an official website with the Department of Environmental Protection. Right, and congratulations on having this program for oh, 20 years now, 20 years, right? Yeah. That's amazing. Hey, we're back here with our wonderful New Jersey Ambassador 17. Mm -hmm. Watershed 17. We're just going to call him 17. <laughs> <laughs> here uh, at, the, at the wonderful Bridgeton Library, and um, Marcella is going to show us this. What is this? So this is a uh, dichotomous key. We use it to identify. Dichotomous. Yeah. What does that mean? Do you know? <laughs> uh, so die just means two. You didn't know there was going to be a test. Did you? <laughs> yeah, so it's basically just like a series of questions. And there's usually two, and you, you go one way or the other. Oh, I see. Yeah, so okay. that, that does the die. And the so economy. it answers your question. Like, if it has ten legs, go right. Mm -hmm. If it has eight legs, go left. Exactly. Okay. If it has no legs... <laughs> <laughs> there's a section for no legs. You're out of luck. <laughs> um, and, and what does this teach kids? Well, yeah, this, why so, is this important? So we, we use this in the field for our program to identify the macroinvertebrates, we call them, and basically just teach us, you know, uh, different identification skills and... Uh, how to how to identify different organisms. So there's different types of dichotomous key. This one's used for the macroinvertebrates, uh, and we use this in the field to determine how healthy or unhealthy the stream is. Uh, if we find there's basically three types of of uh, invertebrates that we find. I brought a couple of samples. There's uh, pollu pollution intolerant, pollution sensitive, and pollution tolerant. Pollution intolerant, those organisms they can't uh, exist or they can't live in that stream if there's any pollution at all. Mm. Uh, pollution sensitive, they can live with a little bit of pollution, uh, but too much and they'll also die off. And then pollution tolerant, even if it's very dirty water, they'll still be there. So if you go into the stream and you only find the pollution tolerant species, that's a sign that's a pretty bad quality stream. And if you find a lot of the pollution uh, intolerant and pollution sensitive organisms, you'll also, you'll think it's a good stream. Right, and we assign, still alive. Mm -hmm, we assign and what is macro? Scores. What does macro mean? Macro means something that we can see with our naked eye, something that's big. We're macro, this table is macro. Right. Something like a bacteria or a cell, you one a cell. Exactly, that's a micro. Okay, gotcha. An invertebrate is just uh, something without a backbone. So wow. we, we're vertebrates so because we have backbones. Invertebrates would be like what's on this list just uh, clams, uh, leeches, worms, different types of flies. Uh, and y'all just start with. Um, this first organism that we have here, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's called a case-building caddisfly, and this is the first pollution intolerant species that we'll go over. And basically, how we identify this, we start looking at our key, and we see that it has no shell. We see that it has legs, and we can, if we counted the legs, we would see six legs, three pairs of legs. But then, it doesn't really look like it has any tails at the end of its body. It does have like these cases around it, which is a pretty big sign to identify where it is. Once you go into no tails, then we ha you have a pretty big list. Mm. So you have to use different little, th there's no longer, you know, two options. Now you have to right. read the descriptions, try to figure out what it is from that. And since this has a case around it, we can figure out that it's a caddisfly and that it's a case building caddisfly. The other type of caddisfly is a net spinner caddisfly. And that one's not, is found without a case. This one, it can also be found without a case. Uh, you can see one right here flowing around without one. And the way to differentiate between the, um, this without a case and the net spinner would be looking at the first thoracic segment uh, or the first segment in its body would usually be hard. Um, and while the net spinner would have two or three uh, plates that are harder. Now, is it hard to also to determine what something is if something has a life cycle? Like, mm -hmm. don't they all change? The, don't exactly. They go yeah. from being, you know... A little, larvae like this to, larvae to like a, a fly, or we have dragonflies too. They, you, they look more like the classic dragonfly. And basically, we only find the nymphs or the beginning cycle of the, these organisms. Um, so if we find like one of the flies or one of the dra adult dragonflies, we wouldn't count them for our purposes. 
Gotcha. What else have you got in your little box of tricks there? <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, we have this mayfly nymph. Nymph is, like I said, the, the beginning life cycle. Just hold it steady cycle. a little bit so Glenn can get a little shot of that. Um, and the way to identify this is seeing that it has three uh, tails at the end of its body. It three has tails? Three tails. What? It also has a three pairs of legs and no shells. So you go down to this option. No shells. Yeah. No, three, three pairs three of legs. Three tails. Three tails. Three so there's only legs, two left. Three tails. Okay. And there's the mayfly or a damselfly. Right. And the way to differentiate between those, the mayfly has the, a thin tail while the, mayfly, the damselfly has three big or like tails. They kind of look like paddles. Getting a spam call while we're in the middle of this stuff. No worries. <laughs> then we have the, the stonefly. This one's a little hard to see. Um, the stonefly is another pollution intolerant. So this is something you want to find. Uh, they have no, no shells, three pairs of legs, but they only have two tails. And for two tails, you have three different organisms. Uh, the elderfly has spikes on the side of its body, so that's not it. The mayfly has gills on its abdomen. This one has gills. If we were able to zoom in closer, it has gills underneath its armpits or its, its legs. Uh, so this is a stonefly, and that's a way to differentiate. It doesn't have gills on its abdomen, but it has gills underneath its legs, like armpit hair. This is so cool. The, yeah, the, the mayfly. Nymph, the mayfly. It's such an unusual creature. <laughs> Um, then we have these snails, and there's two types of snails. There's lung snails that can breathe in the air, or gilled snails that can be underwater. And gilled snails are what are the ones we want to find, the ones that can't exist if there's any pollution. Right. And the way to differentiate between the two types of snails, if you point them up, the lung snail will have its opening on the left side, so you can remember that LL, and the mm -hmm. gilled snail will have it on the right side. And why do you think a gilled snail would be more susceptible to a polluted place than a lunged snail? Is it because of the way that they take in the water? Right, yeah. So the gilled snail wouldn't be using that water, or the, it would be using that water to, to breathe and to consume oxygen. So if the water is very polluted, it'll... it'll it's affecting all yeah. of its... All and of the, its... the lunged snail could just breathe the air outside. Oh, I see. I see a lunged snail. All right. Then we have these big guys uh, here. Ooh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> these are the, the Dobson fly, fish fly. Uh, for, for our program, we categorize them the same. They're also known as uh, helgramites. They look, um, they look very close. Yeah, that's why we, we just uh, categorize them the same way whenever we're counting them. Uh, but they have spikes on their abdomens or filaments. Um, they have no, no obvious cells. They have like little finger-like things at the end of their bodies. Um, mm. And they have very big pincers at the mouth. So in, the, in a stream, they'll grow a lot bigger as well, and they can, they can bite your fingers sometimes. Uh, it's nothing deadly, just like a little pinch. Is that what they use to eat mm -hmm. with? Or? Yeah, they use that to, to hunt smaller bugs and oh, okay. eat them. Okay, gotcha. And do, the, do these Dobson fly or fish fly turn into something else, or is this their adult form? And do they actually fly, or do they just live in the water? Uh, I think they'll. I'm not actually sure about their life cycle, but most of the organisms in in this that we studied eventually get wings and fly around. Okay. And they're just living in the water as they're, when they're young. Or they can be on top of the water too, probably because they're so mm -hmm. light. Maybe. Yeah, just float know. or floating on top. Yeah. But most of these, the way we find them would be underwater, attached to roots or. Can rocks. I see that one that you just put in? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Now, what if kids say to you something like, oh, this is gross. <laughs> Do you have anything, any encouraging something to tell them? Like it's all nature or it's good. Science is good. Or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think they're gross as well, but you just, just have to go into it. be lucky that you didn't come back as one of these guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or that they're not bigger. <laughs> or that they're, they're beneficial because they feed mm -hmm. other critters. Yeah, they're part of the right? life cycle or the, the food cycle of the stream. Exactly. And, uh, and also, they're, as you keep saying, they're health monitors mm -hmm. of, a, of a stream. So yeah, and we that... call them bioindicators. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. um, here we have a water snipe. Uh, 
this one has no shells it has legs and if you look very closely it has like a lot of little bumps on the side they're not really legs um but we call them we just say they have like caterpillar like legs oh i see what you're saying like those little suction mm -hmm. cups that caterpillars have and they have like two um four leg tails that look like antenna so what you think is the head is actually the end of its body and its <laughs> head is a really tiny little like Oh, that's Face. its head? Yeah, exactly. I was exactly. looking at that as its tail. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> its tail looks like its head, and its head looks like its tail. Let's see that go. creature. It's tiny, huh? Yeah, yeah. Are there two of them in here? Mm -hmm. I see. Glenn, did you get a shot of that? Do you want me to hold it another way? Okay. Do you want me to open it up and show it? <laughs> <laughs> that's very cool. What, do you, what kind of solution do you keep these critters in? Uh, this is just a mixture of like alcohol and water at different proportions. And it, and it keeps the, their bodies yeah, from sure. disintegrating? And this kid's probably around three years old now. So they're oh, still in pretty good shape. That's not too bad. They're yeah. in good shape. Um, and this is the last of the water tolerant, or in, sorry, pollution uh, intolerant. And these we label with little happy face, uh, all the ones, to show that they're, you know, they're, you want to find those. Mm -hmm. And water pennies... We don't really find them in South Jersey as much. Um, they attach themselves to rocks. They're, oh, here's, or it's kind of hard to get them to float the right way. But the top of, the, of their body, it looks like a penny, and it camouflages with the rocks. The underside of its body, it, body, it, looks, it actually looks like a, a bug with the three sec, or the three, the head, the abdomen, the, the thorax, thorax in the middle. You know, um, I've seen I've seen a lot of these out and about mm -hmm. in streams on rocks. Yeah, they, that's where they they live on rocks. That's really cool. I've never I've never seen one in a little jar before, but. So yeah, they're pretty common in what we call riffles, and riffles are normally found in streams that have rocks at the bottom, right. and the rocks make the water go up in like circular motions and breaks oxygen from the top to the bottom. So that's where these guys like to live in these oxygenated waters. Uh, but a lot of the streams down in South Jersey have mud at the, mud at the bottom, mm. so that's why we don't find those as much down mm. here. Yeah, I'm used to my little rocky northern <laughs> Jersey streams. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so now that was the last one of the pollution intolerant ones. We're going to go a little bit more into the pollution sensitive ones. And um, in a stream where you only find these, it's probably a medium level stream. Um, but if you find these with the Pollution intolerance is a good sign. You always want biodiversity in the stream. Mm -hmm. So even the pollution tolerance, if you find them, there's not necessarily a sign the water is bad. If that's the only thing you find, that's when it might be a little bit concerning. So first we're gonna go into the other uh, caddisfly species. Uh, this is the net spinner. Um, they're very similar looking to the caddisfly. They just have um, their, their thorax segments They'll have different like hard parts on top instead of the caddisfly that only has the first segment that's hard. And it also has these tufts at the end of its body and claws. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just used to like grab on, um, grab onto stuff. Who feeds on these critters? Everybody? Yeah, fish, just birds, fi fish and other yeah, bugs. Exactly, yeah. And probably the, the dobson fly, fish fly would feed on these smaller bugs and fish feed on these. Gotcha. And then birds and us, we feed on the fish. And then we have this big guy, it's a water, or a crane fly, sorry. The crane fly, it has no shell and no legs. This is the first of the no legs ones that we've seen. And crane flies are just, they're very plump. They look like worms and um, they're kind of transparent. You can kind of see the insides of it. Um, and they could grow a lot bigger as well. Oh, you could you could see their guts. <laughs> oh, look at that! The little worm intestines. Nice. It makes me think what I'm gonna have for dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, worm guts. <laughs> so now we have the so bug. Um, the so. Yes, S O W. So okay. And this guy is another one of our ten plus legs creatures. Um, the soul bug is kind of flat top to bottom, uh, and it has, this, it has a lot of legs on the side, and it has very distinct uh, last segment of its body that's just a lot bigger. Um, yeah, and that it just has a lot part, of legs. Yeah, right. kind of looks like a, a rolled out roly poly almost. Oh, nice. That's a cool bug. Hmm. 
Isn't it amazing how many insects there are on the yeah. planet? And it's only a very small... Such a small percentage yeah. of them. Wow. There you go. Thank you. Um, then we have this damselfly. Uh, I talked a little bit about it be uh, earlier when I was talking about the mayfly and how to differentiate between the two. And these damselflies, they have a very long uh, end to themselves, and they don't have gills. The mayfly would have gills from the abdomen. These guys don't. And they have those three very oar-like tails that, that they used to paddle with. And, and that's... Is yeah. the damselfly... Uh, is, how does it differ from... Um, a dragonfly. So the dragonfly is very stocky. Uh, it also doesn't have any tails at the end like this one does. It does have like three little spikes, the dragonfly. Uh, and it uses that to shoot out water to move around pretty fast. Uh, for some reason, I always thought a damselfly was a female dragonfly. But that's not <laughs> true. Right? No, no, yeah. It's a little different. bit more like delicate looking almost. Uh, longer. Uh, and it uses that like its body shape to to use it, and its tails to swim around. And what is a nymph means that it's just that's the first stage exactly, of yeah. its life, right? Mm -hmm. So eventually, do you know how big it'll? Isn't it? Doesn't it get like about that big? Or mm, I'm not sure exactly. A damselfly, I think so. I think it gets a little big. I mean, do you have a dragonfly? Yes, I do. Can oh, that's actually the next one, <laughs> huh? the dragonfly nymph. Uh, so it looks a lot different from the dragonfly that we're used to seeing in movies and cartoons. Um, or in my backyard. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it has that big stocky um, whole shape to it, uh, and it has like a bulbous end. Uh, and it has three little spikes at, in, at its end, and it, it shoots water out of it to, you know, zoom around uh, in oh. its pond. And the wings, the sets of wings are really intense that they have, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I didn't really mention that before, but the mayfly, damselfly, stonefly, they also have, like, wing pads. Uh, they're, oh, sorry, they're That's in okay. early development. I've never seen a, a dragonfly nymph before. It's so little. <laughs> they're very cool. I love how they come in different colors and sizes <laughs> exactly. and shapes, too. The red ones, the green ones, the blue ones. And some of these are a little bit discolored just from the solution and from being yeah. here. So, so this is a, a scud. They kind of look like sow bugs um, or shrimps. They're, like the sow bug, they're also flat, but they're flat side to side. The sow bug was flat top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, they just kind of look like shrimp. Um, a, lot of, a lot of little legs on them. And they move very fast as well. They, they're side swimmers. Uh, so they just kind of like crunch and zoom around the water. And that has a happy face on it. So you're <laughs> happy when you find these, right? Exactly. Cool. Do you have a crayfish? Yes, I do have. No, you don't. A crayfish. It's and a I can <laughs> show the next one. It's a pretty small one. You can see it's pincers. That's the easiest way to identify it. And it has a flat tail at the butt at the end. That it looks uses like a paddle. little lobster. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's so cool. Uh, when I was talking about before, when I was living in Northern California in Austin Creek, we used to see crayfish. I'd be, have to be careful when I was wading in the in the stream not mm -hmm. to crush it. But I was like, oh, <laughs> should I should I have this for lunch or should I just <laughs> let him go? And I never took one. <laughs> wow, that is so awesome. Love their little eyes <laughs> and their little pinchers. Yeah, and that's again the easiest way to identify the pins. They're 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 very different from the rest of the organisms. They really are. Uh, are they considered a shellfish or it's just is it a bug? Uh, well, not all macroinvertebrates are bugs. Right. We just call oh, yeah, them, like the shellfish up here. Yeah, right? and the worms. Um, and the worms. So they're just you know they're they're. The macroinvertebrates is just something we can are. see and something we okay. can use to identify the health of so the stream. So it's a pretty wide mm -hmm. variety of exactly. stuff. Exactly. Cool. Um, and yeah, so I was actually going to talk about clams next. <laughs> uh -huh. And clams, they're kind of like the, the, the snails, um, except they don't have only one shell. They have two shells. Uh, same with mussels. They are attached at a hinge, and they can open and close. Um, so that's a way to differentiate between that and... Snails, they might look different, like orb snails or, or limpets. They call them bivalves, right? Yeah. <laughs> we know that from going to the Bayshore Center. <laughs> we saw so many oysters. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, so that was the, the last of my 
pollution, uh, intolerant, pollution sensitive guys, uh, the rest, if this is the only thing you can find in the stream, it's a pretty bad sign for the health of the stream. Um, and this one's pretty small, but this is the black fly. Um, this one is also a no legged kind of guy. Uh, I guess maybe I can... And they, they and roaches can live through everything, anything, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yeah, so black flies, they, they kind of have like a light bulb at the end of their body and they use that to hang on to the bottom of the stream and then they just float around trying to catch prey that way. Look, it has a sad face on it. <laughs> <laughs> so if that's the only one that you see, meh, meh, meh. Wow, those are cool. Yeah, and you can kind of see the bulb at the end. Yeah, I see that. That's wonderful. It's not wonderful if it's <laughs> the only thing you find, but... If you find in and of, other it, stuff, yeah. of itself, it's a wonderful little creature. So then I have two samples of the, the midge fly. Uh, and these guys, it kind of just look like, like worms, um, except they have little stumps or um, li like little forelegs at the end of its head and at the bottom of its body. Okay. Um, and usually uh, here they're pretty white, but they come almost in very bright red almost, uh, in a lot of streams. Uh, they're very small. Sometimes they're hard to miss. They're, yeah, they're easy to miss uh, along with all the dirt and leaves that you get when you collect them. Wow. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know how to f try to find it in like a <laughs> scoop of detritus yeah. or something, you know? And usually when they're the bright red version, they're pretty, they're a lot easier to see. And then the last guy that I have is the earthworm. Oh, yeah. Uh, and this looks a lot like the mish. It just doesn't have the four legs. Uh, at the uh, any anywhere in his body is segmented. Uh, it's long. What's this? What's this one's name? The aquatic earthworm. Aquatic earthworm. Small hair like or looks like earthworm. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> oh, that looks neat. That's probably really hard to find, also. Mm -hmm. But they're usually a lot longer than uh, midges. So that gives them away. And this is another species that if you just find these, mm -hmm. it's it's probably not a very healthy exactly healthy stream or creek. That's great. Is there anything else that we should be asking you, or <laughs> did we go through everything? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't have any samples of the leeches. That's right. another pollution uh, tolerant. So that's also another thing you don't want to find. They're just, you know, they kind of look like worms. Just uh, they're black and they're segmented. They get. They have two little mouths on both ends of their bodies they used to suck on. Um, yeah. And also didn't have an alder fly. Okay. Uh, and that kind of looks like the dobson fly, fish fly, except they have one long tail at the end of their body. Let's and they see. have a different number of filaments coming out of their abdomen. Well, this is wonderful. Marcella, thank you so much for coming here today and for bringing all this wonderful stuff. We're so happy to have you and, uh, and, and showing us how important it is to do this type of work to mm -hmm. see the health of a stream exactly because it all goes with the watershed health, yeah you know? and you know to make you know if you need to pay more attention to that particular stream right. if it's poor quality or so then something must be getting into it to mm -hmm. in order to for it to be you know not a good habitat for the rest of these macro invertebrates mm -hmm.